Thanks to everyone for being here. We're going to have the best turnout for one of these conferences to date. What I've seen is that when I started out writing the Wired story and reporting on it back in early 2009 and, and first got in touch with Kirk and John and so on, the Thorium movement was just that. It was a movement comprising a small group of activists and scientists and technicians. And since then, it's grown into what you see in this room. It's really become a, a business movement. I call it a crusade in the book, which uh, I'm not sure that was the best choice of words. It really has you know, developed channels that were not present when I first started looking at it. And it's, it's very encouraging. And as I keep telling people, the thorium revival is inevitable. It's going to happen. The question is whether we in this country are going to be leaders or followers. And when I have been talking about the book um, on the radio and elsewhere recently, I usually give the sort of thorium introduction, thorium 101. Here's what it is, here's how it works, here's what a lifter is, and so on. I'm not going to do that today because I think this is a pretty well-informed crowd. So I'm going to do kind of the chapter 10 version, a, a brief version of the last chapter of the book, and really talk about this is how I see this as a possibility for the U.S. This is what the stakes are. This is what we risk. Risk is a big word in this presentation um, if we don't do it, and uh, here's how we can move forward. In 416 AD, a Roman bureaucrat named Rutilius Nemationus set, set out from the imperial capital to his homeland of Gaul. He wrote an account of his journey in a long poem called De Reditu Suo, which means of his return. It's a vivid portrait of the empire in decline. The most remarkable thing about Rutilius's return was that he traveled by sea. In the final decades of an empire famed for its vast network of roads that connected much of the known world, he thought going by boat was safer and quicker. Here's what he said, I have chosen the sea since roads by land, if on the level are flooded by rivers, if on higher ground are beset with rocks. Since Tuscany and since the Aurelian highway after suffering the outrages of Goths with fire or sword could no longer control forest with homestead or river with bridge, it is better to entrust my sails to the wayward sea. In other words, by the time of Rutilius's return, the empire's decline was already inescapable. Roads had decayed, aqueducts had collapsed, cities lay in ruins, and harbors had silted. Somewhere I read that there's over 200 theories to explain the fall of Rome, and they range from poisoning by wine goblets made of lead to moral decadence to the hiring of mercenary armies to replace the Roman legionaries. One of the more recent was outlined by uh, Joseph Tainter in a 1990 book called The Collapse of Complex Societies, which I highly recommend if you haven't read it. Um, Tainter's work was the basis for a lot of what Jared Diamond wrote about in Collapse. Tainter said it had to do with what's called energy return on investment. Simply put, the energy required to maintain the Roman lifestyle the monuments, the games and spectacles, the feasting, the centrally heated bathhouses, and so on, became more and more costly as the centuries passed. Fertile cropland was depleted, and landscapes were deforested. The empire had to import grain from farther and farther afield, even as the imperial infrastructure, roads, bridges, aqueducts, grain mills, fortifications, fell into disrepair. Remote borders became harder to defend, and the army, the source of Rome's might for a millennium, went underfed and unmotivated. At the end, Rome was easy pickings. And here's a quote from Tainter. The great problem that the empire faced was that they would have to incur very high costs just to maintain the status quo. They had to invest very high amounts in solving problems that don't yield a net positive return, but instead simply allowed them to maintain what they already had. I would argue that that's a succinct description of the predicament we find ourselves in today. Essentially, Imperial Rome fell because it failed to diversify its energy sources. Remarkably, an innovative technology existed to do just that. Rome was the first civilization to develop all the necessary components for the world's first steam engine, but it never built one for practical use. In the first century AD, a man named Hero of Alexandria described an alophile named for Aeolus, the god of wind now considered the first device powered by steam. A Greek living under Roman rule 
Hero devised a water-filled cauldron heated by fire. With a pair of tubes projecting upward from its lid, the tube supported a metal sphere, spinning on its horizontal axis with two nozzles or tip jets protruding from it, bent in opposite directions. Steam expelled through the nozzles generated thrust that spun the ball. It was considered a marvel of ingenuity, but something of a parlor trick. Roman engineers already knew how to build cylinder drive pistons, which are water pumps without return valves, and gearing in water mills and clocks and so on, but they never thought to use steam to drive machines to perform labor. Why should they when slave labor was so plentiful? In her great book, The March of Folly, the historian Barbara Tuckman catalogs a series of critical turning points at which governments and societies trapped by the status quo and determined to maintain it, despite mon contrary mounting evidence, failed to leap imaginatively, to take bold and rational measures to change the course of events. Tuckman called it pursuit of policy contrary to self-interest. Here's a quote from Tuckman. Wooden-headedness, the source of self-deception, is a factor that plays a remarkably large role in government. It consists in assessing a situation in terms of preconceived fixed notions while ignoring or rejecting any contrary signs. That definition, assessing a situation in terms of preconceived fixed notions while ignoring or rejecting any contrary signs, applies perfectly to the current nuclear power industry. Ignoring the potential for thorium power in the 1960s and 70s was short-sighted. To do so now would be folly. The emperor Diocletian, who reigned in the third century AD, staved off the fall of the Roman Empire by oppressing the, present, the peasantry, raising taxes to crushing levels, expanding a stifling bureaucracy, and building up the army with the employment of mercenaries. Diocletian assessed the situation in terms of his preconceptions. And it worked for 20 or 30 years, but it looks mighty foolish 17 centuries later. <laughs> Hi, Bill. Enacting the same policy that hasn't worked to date, only more forcefully, is a concise definition of the nuclear industry strategy for its 21st century so-called renaissance. Energy policy today across the West, but particularly in the United States, is determined by a toxic blend of wooden-headedness, economic self-interest, scientific ignorance, theology, and technological inertia. The nuclear power industry, in particular, has been ruled for decades by technological lock-in, which is the tendency of established technologies to crowd other competing and possibly superior systems out of the market. The most famous example, of course, is Microsoft Windows. Few people would suggest that Windows is the ideal operating system for a personal computer. Nevertheless, it controls about 90% of the PC market. In a similar way, the stagnation of nuclear power technology has been apparent now for decades. This is uh, Robin Cowan, a professor at the University of Strasbourg, writing in 1990. While an appropriate decision at the time, it now seems that light water reactors may have been an unfortunate choice. One of the interesting features of this history is the belief held by many that light water is not the best technology, either economically or technically. Nearly every nuclear power executive and expert with ties to the existing nuclear power industry that I've spoken to in the last three years has uttered some version of the classic line from a story from the Nashville Tennessean, um, which quoted Paul Genoa of the Nuclear Energy Institute, which if you don't know is the trade association for the conventional nuclear power industry. Genoa told the Tennessean, you don't just walk away from that and try the new shiny toy, even if the new shiny toy might work better. Think about that for a moment, even if it works better. So let's talk about disasters and risk. On September 9th, 2010, a natural gas pipeline exploded in San Bruno, California, killing eight people in nearby homes immediately. 35 houses were leveled and dozens more damaged. Two days later, crews found a crater 167 feet long, 26 feet wide, and 39 feet deep. It was as if an asteroid the size of a refrigerator had gouged the earth. You don't hear too much about the San Bruno natural gas pipeline explosion these days. But it was one of a rash of industrial accidents that included the 2006 Sago mine disaster, which killed 12, the collapse of the Kingston Fossil Plant in 2008 in Tennessee, 
which resulted in the largest release of coal ash in U.S. history, and the Upper Big Branch coal mine explosion that killed 29 miners in April 2010. The most famous, of course, also happened in April of 2010. A blast brought down the Deepwater Horizon offshore oil rig, killing 11 workers and spilling about 206 million gallons of crude into the Gulf of Mexico. Other countries are not immune. In July 2010, an oil pipeline exploded at the port of Dalian in northeast China, resulting in the worst oil spill in Chinese history. So now let's talk about the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident, result, of course, of the earthquake and tsunami that devastated Japan's eastern coast last year. Three people died in that accident. Two young workers trapped in the turbine hall of Reactor 4, which ironically was the only unit that contained no fuel at the time of the earthquake and tsunami, plus a third man who died at Fukushima Daini, Daiichi's sister plant nearby. I'm not trying to minimize what happened at Fukushima. It'll take decades and billions of dollars to clean up after the accident and the damage to the national psyche of Japan, which of course is a country that prided itself on putting to safe and peaceful work the force that had destroyed two of its cities in 1945, was incalculable. However, in the context of the natural disaster of the quake and tsunami, which killed at least 18,000 people, the nuclear accident was a footnote. And in comparison with the fossil fuel disasters that I've just described, it hardly rates mention. Arnold Gunderson is a former nuclear power executive who served as an expert witness during the investigation of the Three Mile Island accident. And here's what he said. Fukushima was the biggest industrial catastrophe in the history of mankind. That gives you a sense of how distorted our notions of the dangers of nuclear power are. So let's talk about risk. This is my son's favorite game. He always beats me. Fukushima really highlighted the public's misperception of risk. We're not very good at calculating risk. From its earliest days, the nuclear power industry has faced a fundamental dichotomy around risk. The chances of a, of a significant accident at any single nuclear power plant are very, very small. In many ways, nuclear power is one of the safest industries in the world today. However, the theoretically possible consequences of a runaway nuclear accident are almost unimaginable. So the chances of it happening are small. The possible con consequences are huge. Apart from a comparatively small group of scientists and engineers, many of whom are in this room, most nuclear technologists, as a result of this dichotomy, are hemmed in by an incrementalism that eliminates the possibility of bold and visionary leaps. Only the smallest and most predictable next step is safe, and you can see that at work in the work of the Blue Ribbon Commission on the future of nuclear power. Only small adjustments to existing technology are acceptable risks. The perception of danger is too high. As a result, we're stuck with 1970s technology. It's like we're all using Atari portable computers and driving Ford Fairlanes. So compare the risks associated with fossil fuels. This is the really scary uh, chart. And basically, it's a compendium of predictions on global warming in terms of uh, rise in temperature Celsius, degrees Celsius. Despite the quarrels of some US politicians and a few holdout junk scientists, there's no question that by continuing to burn huge quantities of coal, oil, and natural gas, we are hastening the onset of disastrous global climate change. Everyone here knows the risks. In a century or less, many large coastal cities could be underwater. Millions of acres of agricultural land will have turned to desert. Severe drought will be widespread. And resource wars fought over increasingly scarce supplies of water and energy will be common. That's a sort of hazy and distant prospect for most people, especially most Americans. And it's less persuasive than the small but real risk of nuclear accident that has been amply displayed at Chernobyl and now at Fukushima Daiichi. Our misperceptions of risk are multiplied by, quote, the false belief that our tools could measure uncertainty, wrote Nassim Nicholas Taleb in his bestseller about the miscalculation of risk, The Black Swan. Taleb wrote, the applications of the sciences of uncertainty to real world problems has had ridiculous effects. 
Of course, he was speaking mostly of the financial markets, where the tendency to overlook outlying and unlikely possibilities, the tendency to overlook risk, um, helped result in the economic crash of 2008. Taleb argues that in planning for the future, it's human nature not to account for highly improbable yet catastrophic disruptions. The explosion of the Space Shuttle Columbia, the assassination of JFK, or the Fukushima tsunami. Because our forecasting models are ruled by the bell curve of predictability. Nuclear power is one of the few areas of modern life where the opposite is true. Nuclear power has a reverse black swan problem. The merest possibility of black swan events like that another Chernobyl or another Fukushima has wrapped the entire industry in a net of anxiety and caution. Another example would be the so-called war against terrorism. Since 2001, fears of another devastating terror attack have poisoned American life and cost Americans billions of dollars in ways both visible in terms of long lines at, at airport security and invisible in terms of foreigners, foreign students, et cetera, foreign scientists not being able to, to come to the U.S. and, and lend their, their talents and their expertise. Despite the comparatively clear record of safety of the nuclear power industry, nuclear energy's potential, at least in the U.S., has been stifled by risks that are almost too small to measure. So here's a couple of counterexamples. The Manhattan Project and the Apollo program to land men on the moon. Both depended on technologies that did not exist at their inception. Both called forth entire new industries based around those technologies, industries that had no obvious everyday benefits or profit potential before they arose, and both entailed high opportunity costs in that they demanded resources, financial and intellectual, for example, that could have been devoted to other more easily obtainable objectives. So what's happened? What's changed? What has happened to render us incapable of summoning the will, the confidence, and the unity to produce similar achievements against a threat that is every bit as existential as World War II and the Cold War? Most obviously, the political system. I don't need to tell John and uh, Jim Kennedy how impossible it is to get the U.S. Congress to take action on critical matters of long-term national security and prosperity. The other change is in the financial system. Current levels of government debt make a new Manhattan Project, which I've heard people in the Thorium movement uh, call for, for energy impossible. At the same time, the evolution of the private sector financial system, particularly in private equity and the stock market, favors quick returns over long-term investing, clear exit strategies over building new industries and new technologies for the common good, and consumer-focused technologies mobile phones, social media, new forms of entertainment over large and complex infrastructure projects. And of course, we've seen that unfold just in the last few weeks with the belly flop of an IPO of Facebook. In other words, we can't do it because we've never done it before. And even if we could do it, the public would never support it. Here's a counter example. John gave a favorable mention to industrial policy. To say that the U.S. no longer in engages in industrial policy is a fallacy. In March 2009, President Obama, recognizing that the liquidation of major automakers would have a disastrous effect on the larger U.S. economy, committed the federal government to what amounted to a takeover of GM and Chrysler. I don't need to take you through all of the, the details, but essentially we provided a total of $80 billion in loans and investments. U.S. taxpayers took a large equity stake in the failing car makers. By the end of that year, both companies had exit, exited bankruptcy and begun paying back the loans from the U.S. Treasury. In the first quarter of last year, both, along with Ford, posted quarterly net profits and were achieving their first sustained net sales gains since the 1980s. The turnaround of the U.S. auto industry has helped stabilize the overall economy and helped the U.S. manufacturing sector add almost a quarter million jobs between the end of 2009 and mid-2011. In this case, industrial policy, which is a term of contempt in Washington, D.C., worked. So what are the lessons from the auto industry bailout for the energy industry? First, there has to be a sense of crisis. Two major U.S. automakers failing in the midst of a global financial crash constituted a crisis. 
The majority of Americans at the moment do not see the prospect of catastrophic global warming as a crisis. That has to change. Broad social and national competitiveness goals, not just narrow shareholder value, must guide the transformation. Having a strong and competitive auto industry is seen as a key national interest. Also a key national interest is having a strong, competitive, and innovative energy industry. New technology must be the basis of the transformation. With a few new notable exceptions, the nuclear power industry's plans for its next generation of reactors can be summarized as the same, only more so. Any broad nationwide energy strategy should promote and require the rapid development and deployment of new forms of nuclear power, especially liquid-fueled thorium reactors. Government support is necessary, but it must be limited and conditional. While the big automakers round up, wound up repaying the billions invested in them by the U.S. government, the funding came with a price. They had to replace top executives and invest in new technology and new production systems. A similar change has to happen at the top of the U.S. energy industry. Finally, the transformation must draw on America's competitive advantages. The competitive advantages of the U.S. energy sector include the top engineering schools in the world, a vibrant alternative energy investment market, a pervasive though aging power grid, and large numbers of experienced technologists and entrepreneurs and investors who view the energy crisis as the signal challenge of the 21st century. Plus, we invented molten salt thorium fueled reactors. So there have been various estimates made about the, the cost of electricity from thorium reactors. They range from around uh, 3.8 cents per kilowatt hour to around uh, 2,200 per kilowatt of capacity, plus or minus 30 percent. The simple answer is no one really knows at the moment because we haven't built them and, and financed them yet. But one thing to think about is the social costs, which are rarely factored into energy, any calculations of the cost of power generation. Liquid fuel thorium reactors are carbon free. Their contribution to proliferation risk is near zero. Not only do they essentially eliminate the cost of long-term storage of radioactive waste, but they provide benefits by processing existing waste from conventional plants. And they will jumpstart a new era of internet energy technology innovation. So how much do we need? Basically, my sort of back of the napkin calculations resulted in the U.S. uses around 4 million gigawatt hours a year of electricity. We have about 1,000 gigawatts of total capacity right now. Um, what I'm outlining is a program that would deliver 500 gigawatts of capacity from liquid-fueled thorium reactors. So here are the goals. Build a prototype in five years, commercialize lifters starting in 2020, supply half of U.S. electricity demand by 2050, 500 gigawatts or 500,000 megawatts of clean, low-cost energy. 500 1,000 megawatt plants or 2,250 megawatt lifters that could be arrayed to uh, assemble larger plants. That's about 20 new plants a year from 2020 to 2050 or 80 250 megawatt lifters. What I'm talking about is building four manufacturing plants, each of which could produce around 20 reactors or five plants a year. Those are hugely ambitious goals. No one should underestimate how the, the size of that endeavor. However, Bob Hargraves has pointed out in the past that Boeing builds about one $200 million jet per day, and a modern airliner has many, many more moving parts in total overall complexity than a lifter. If we built these plants, we could just about build enough 1,000 megawatt uh, nuclear plants to produce 500 gigawatts of power. Technology advances will bring the cost of these reactors down rapidly. I'm going to call it $1 billion per 1,000 megawatt plant. Again, that's an ambitious goal. So the cost of building 600,000 megawatt plants or 2,400 250 megawatt reactors would come to 600 billion. Add in 15% for financing and startup costs and round up, you get 700 billion. The 2010 Department of the U.S. Department of Defense was 685 billion. In other words, for about what we spend in one year on defense, which is around what the rest of the world combined spends on the military, 
we can lay the foundation for a thorium-based, carbon-free energy economy that could last a millennium. Many people, including people in this room, will consider that what I've just outlined too risky, too expensive, or unrealistic. We can't do it because we've never done it before. But if you consider the costs of any other type of power, whether it's conventional nuclear, coal, solar, natural gas, or the cost of doing nothing, building a couple of dozen lifters a year starts to sound like a bargain. Remember, the obstacles to creating a thorium power economy in the next 40 years are not technological. They're not even economic. They are political and perceptual. Ultimately, the thorium revival is about the choices we make as a society. If we don't do it, it will be because we chose not to, not because it was impossible. Thanks very much. We just have a minute or two for questions. Does anybody have a question or two for Rick? Hey, Jim. I want to be unfair and poke at you a little bit. Your example about industrial policy in the auto industry was great, except I would argue that it was an accidental industrial policy and basically a function of politics. Same result, of course, but the complaining on the right side about bailing them out and they all should have failed, you know, was very loud. But it was a political decision, not based on industrial policy, but it had the same effect. So sorry to pick, but John and I spent enough time in D.C. to know that uh, it wasn't industrial policy they were practicing, it was pure politics. What Jim's saying is that the auto industry bailout was not true industrial policy, and what I, I take, take it you mean by that is an industrial policy that was thought out and planned in advance. It was a political reaction to political realities. I totally agree. Um, what's interesting is that right now the candidates from both political parties are claiming credit for the auto industry bailout. So however it came about, it to me, it amounted to industrial policy. But it certainly wasn't intentional. Nobody said, let's right. do the right thing for the right reasons. They said, let me protect my political skin and nothing else. Yeah, and, and that's what I meant by a sense of crisis, right? There's not similar political skin in the game for the energy industry for a, a lot of reasons that you're all familiar with. Yes, sir. One more? Yeah, one more. One more. Yeah, and there's several chapters in the book about the influence of the military on energy policy and specifically the nuclear power industry. Um, in my day job for Pike Research, we've released several reports about how, somewhat paradoxically, the military right now is actually at the forefront of renewable and sustainable energy because they're losing men every day trucking fuel to the front lines in Afghanistan. They need portable, sustainable energy. And so, um, you know, as Kirk has talked about, some of the licensing issues could be actually resolved and brought forward by the military. So I think that's a good point. Excellent. Thanks Thank very you, much. Rick.